Snow Tracks is sponsored by Ski Do, Polaris Terrain Domination, and by FXR Racing Full Throttle Addiction. Last year, I got the opportunity to head out to BC, a place that I don't ever ride mountain sleds in, and go on an adventure with Carl Kuster from CKMP. The area in BC, uh, just outside of Sycamus, was so different where you could ride. I mean, it wasn't just like go up into the mountains and it's deep powder. It was go up into the mountains and there's wicked cool bowls, there's super treat in sections. And then there's also just the extreme sheer cliff, super steep, super deep stuff as well. When AJ got back from his ride with Carl Kuster in BC last year, he told me all these crazy stories about the awesome things that they did while they were there. As soon as I saw the type of terrain they were riding in and how extreme it was and some of the things Carl pushed AJ to do, it immediately became my goal and focus to go out and do exactly the same thing. Snowmobiling started for me at a pretty young age. I remember with my dad, I was maybe 10 or maybe nine, I don't know, I was pretty young. Just rode around home, small farm town, Alberta. But in the 90s, I'd seen uh, a tape, all train racing or something like that with this snowcross stuff on there. And I thought it looked kind of fun, so I thought I'd try it. A lot of people think that I was always a snowcross racer and then went mountain riding. I was a mountain rider for probably 15 years before I even seen a snowcross sled. I just had raced snowcross for a few years and had some success at it and, and really moved back into the mountains and that's where I was always in my element and that's where I felt the most natural was always in the mountains. It was never in snowcross. I remember it clearly when I went to the mountains and looking out the window as a little kid and seeing how high the snow banks were and it looked surreal. It looked like some crazy dream, you know, that there was that much snow. That no matter what, if it was cold or if it was nasty or how much work it was, I always wanted to just go and ride in that deep snow. We bought this property in about 2004 or five. Basically, it was gonna be a retirement project for my dad. As time went by, I came here, spent a lot of time, you know, fix this, fix that, and, and, and it just turned into like a destination for all my buddies. I just thought it was pretty cool that we could, you know, with some changes and some tweaks, we could turn it into something that I could really bring a lot more people out and, and really show people the mountains. I was really excited this season to go back to CKMP because Carl's ride area is so diverse and so different than anything else I've ridden. It truthfully is a mountain park. It gives you so many different experiences that really nowhere else can. I knew that after riding last season with Carl and pushing myself really past where I thought I was capable, uh, trained me to become a better rider and I knew that I was gonna go out and force Luke to do a couple of those things too. I was excited to ride in the Sycamus area with Carl in particular because 
Obviously, I'd heard AJ's stories. I'd heard all the crazy things that Carl had coaxed him to do and taught him how to do. But I also know that that area of BC is spectacular. It is a mountain riding paradise. Carl's setup in particular is quite private. So the places he rides aren't really tracked up. They're not really uh, accessed by a lot of people. So he basically guarantees that you're gonna find fresh powder and untracked areas. So I was pretty excited to be the first one to make some lines and some fresh snow. Snow Tracks is sponsored by snowmobileandquebec.com. This winter, experience snowmobile heaven. first area that we rode in was the burn and I had ridden this last season and really enjoyed it because you kind of get thrown right into it. I mean, it's spindly trees that are all burned off. That's why they call it the burn from a forest fire and nothing but deep powder in between. It was an extreme spot to ride to say the least. Riding in an open field is one thing where there's really no consequences. Even on the side of a steep hill where there's no trees, you feel like you've got some breathing room. Two things became very evident. First, that's tough to do. It's tough to be good riding in a tight treat area like the burn. <laughs> I should have turned out just two feet sooner and I would have made it back down. And two, Carl Kuster is an incredible <laughs> backcountry rider because he was slaying it through the trees like, like there was no trees. Everything he does is so extreme and he does it in such an extreme aggressive way that you're just waiting for the ball to drop and everything to fall apart, and it never does. In the early years, what kept us coming back for more was that we could never get to the top of the hills because the sleds just wouldn't go there. I mean, the long tracks back then were 136, you know, with, with inch and a half paddles. and. Those are the big sleds. As a kid, I remember just being stuck on the trail. It would take us sometimes two days to break 10 kilometers of trail. Didn't take much to outdo your buddy. All you had to do was go another two feet and you outdid him, right? And you know, now it's like hundreds of feet. Mountain riding itself has really, truly changed the last few years. The sleds that manufacturers are delivering right to the showroom floor are so incredibly full of potential. I mean, a Skidoo Summit XM will take you places that truthfully, most new riders should not go. I think one of the things that's really helped push this sport further and further to where it's at today is manufacturers like Skidoo working with innovative backcountry riders like Carl. My history with Skidoo started in the fall of 2001. Blair Morgan Racing signed with Skidoo and you know, I just built friendships through, throughout racing and, and then started doing some other uh, marketing work for Skidoo and some riding for them on the side. And I just naturally wanted to help the people, whether it be in the marketing or engineers or whatever, and I could see how I could help them, teach them things for riding. And, and it was just natural that I, I just wanted to see them do better. It just turned into what CKMP is now. You know, they send people for product knowledge and, and product testing, basically, and, and they give people good instruction on, on how to use the product. You know, he, he doesn't apologize for anything that he does or the way he does it. He tells people, and I believe he tells Skidoo the same thing, here's how I ride, here's how this vehicle should handle, here's what you need to change about it to make it work for, you know, for my riding style, for this person's riding style, to get to this point, to do this, to be more comfortable, to last longer. 
And when companies like Skidoo listen to people like Carl, they can produce vehicles like the Summit XM. And I truthfully believe that's why we have vehicles like that today. Closed captioning of snow tracks is sponsored by Triton Trailers, the cornerstone of every adventure. Last season, Carl forced me to uh, do a very large, very steep descent that I had never really done before. I'd never done anything like that before. It really forced me though to kind of break a barrier of comfort that I knew I needed to to get better. And this season I wanted Luke to do the same thing. And so Carl took us to a similar type place, but actually it was, uh, it was probably a little less steep, but a lot longer to the bottom. AJ thought it was hilarious because he knew how I was going to feel about it and Carl was just indifferent to it the way he was with AJ because it's something he does every day but Carl sent us up to the top and he said all right I want you to go up between those trees up there and just drop off the edge and ride down here. The first trip down the side of the mountain was, I can only describe it as out of control because I really didn't know what I was doing. It was interesting, he was, he was picking along nice and slow the whole time, taking the safe lines and, and really you could tell he was, he was super nervous. After I did it once, after I made it to the bottom and realized I wasn't dead and I was in control. I, all I want to do is do it again. And the, the second and third time I did it, I was on the gas running down the side of the hill. I was actually accelerating on my side and the snow was coming over the hood and there was a few drifts in the middle where you're kind of just pounding through and the snow's flying everywhere. It was, it was one of the best feelings I've ever had on a snowmobile. I think what a lot of people don't really understand or when they first come out there, it's all about the power and, and the climbing. But then once they ride here for a bit, then they finally get to have the feeling of those really long, cool descents. Once you get a couple of those run, man, it is super addicting, you know? And, and going up is fun and that's, you know, that's what snowmobiles really are good at. But coming down is something that I think that most people don't anticipate that they're gonna like. They just happen to do it once and then it just catches them. It's really hard to predict where the sport of snowmobiling is going because it's progressed so fast in the past two, three years. But with people like Carl and other ambassadors to this sport, you can be sure that where it's going is only gonna be better than what it is today. Guys like Carl are just absolutely putting their stamp, their DNA on these vehicles, and it's making all of us better riders. I think mountain riding is on the cusp of a, a real boom. I think people like Carl making the sport accessible to your average trail rider and being willing to teach them how to ride in the mountains is really going to ignite a passion in people who never would have had the chance to be passionate about mountain riding in the past. It's not my past experiences that drive me to help develop these new snowmobiles or have input to develop new snowmobiles. I like doing it because I find it, it it's fun and it's intriguing, but really I wanted to do it for my dad. He 
he was a really good rider, and, but a few years back he started to get sore and he couldn't ride as well as he used to and, and he was only 53 at the time. I just wanted to be able to prolong me and my dad riding together in the mountains because we'd rode together for 30 years. My dad being not as strong as he used to be, I just thought, I really want to make a sled that'll prolong their careers. That's the dream that I have now. You know, although my dad won't get to see it, um, I want it to happen. Trail Tech is sponsored by Princess Auto, the unique world of equipment, tools, and more. Like it or not, there are a good number of people out there who did feel the Nitro MTX was a decent mountain sled. Much of that praise centered around its stellar four-stroke motor. If you're going to ride a four-stroke mountain sled, this is the motor you'd want under the hood. Unfortunately, there was even more people who really didn't like the Nitro MTX chassis for riding in steep and deep powder or tight tree lines. It was heavy, and its CG was much higher than ideal. Which is why Yamaha's newest mountain sled, the Viper MTX 162, is such a welcome addition to Yamaha's growing Viper lineup. Finally, their admirable three-cylinder four-stroke mill we've all come to like so much has found a home inside a mountain chassis where it can live up to its full potential. If there's one thing Yamaha has in spades, it's style. And before I go any further, I just want to take a second to acknowledge how awesome this thing looks sitting on the snow. Even if orange and blue isn't your thing, you got to admit, this is one sexy looking piece of machinery. The number one most important aspect of the Viper MTX is weight. Power to weight ratios are more important in the mountains than anywhere else. At altitude, you start at a horsepower disadvantage and are climbing through deep snow all day long. The Viper MTX is substantially lighter than the Nitro MTX model it replaces. This means it climbs up on top of the snow easier, requires less effort to pull over on its side, and the most important point for a guy like me, it's way easier to dig out when you get it buried. The Viper's 162 by 26 paddle track is a serious combination of rubber and Kevlar. Lesser power plants would struggle to spin this puppy in really deep conditions, but the Viper's four-stroke mill, with its fantastic low-end pull and instantaneous throttle response, seems almost unfazed by all that traction. Ergonomically, this chassis is excellent. The steering post is pretty vertical, so the handlebar action is quite flat. If you're coming from another brand, this can take some getting used to, but after a solid day on the trail, you'll feel right at home with it. Running boards are grippy and do a decent job of clearing snow. The seat is a new unit that's narrow but longer than most mountain seats. At first it seems excessively long, but there are some situations where it can be a benefit and I didn't feel that it got in my way at all. Our Viper MTX is an SE model, which means it comes with a few fancy goodies the others don't, like a cool graphic wrap job, or more notably, a set of genuine Fox Float Evolve front shocks. If you're going to have air shocks in your ride, these are the ones to have. It's no secret I'm not a big fan of air shocks on trail sleds, but in the mountains where weight is more important than a plush ride, they do have their place. Evols offer both lightweight and a decent ride, so everyone wins. It's not going to take most of our more attentive viewers very long to notice that this is not your average Viper. 
this particular unit is sporting a very factory looking mountain performance turbo kit that can be purchased straight out of the Yamaha parts catalog. Claimed horsepower is just over 180, which may not seem overly impressive for a turbo at sea level, but you have to remember, a turbo automatically compensates for thinner air at altitude. So where I rode this sled at 12,000 feet, it still made about 180 ponies. Where other 800s were struggling with numbers in the 115 to 120 horsepower range, I was still pulling like a banshee. At the end of the day, the question is always the same when you're talking about performance four-stroke snowmobiles. The question always is, do you notice the extra weight? And in this case, the answer is simple. Yes, it does feel heavier than a similar sled with an 800 two-stroke under the hood. However, its difference is becoming less and less of an issue. This chassis is so good in deep snow and this motor, especially when boosted, has so much torque, there are many situations you'd be happy to take the extra weight in exchange for all that extra power. In my opinion, the Viper MTX 162 SE represents a very important milestone for Yamaha. It gets them back in the game with a legitimate all-mountain sled whose strengths are not just limited to big bowls or steep chutes. If I was in the market for a new four-stroke mountain sled, I can't say I'd be looking a whole lot further than a Yamaha Viper MTX. Snow Tracks has been sponsored by Polaris Terrain Domination. Arctic Cat, share our passion. And by Go Ride Ontario, yours to discover. If you like this video, post a comment and tell us what you think. Then click on this link to subscribe to Snowtracks TV here on the YouTube channel.